This is Thames from London. News time now at the studios of ITN. MPs are voting now on televising the Commons. Good progress in Geneva. They may talk to the press together. Mrs Reagan says it's not a fashion war. Mr King is attacked by loyalists in Belfast. The machine that made PC Olds walk can help others. Good evening. MPs are voting now on whether to allow television cameras into the Commons for an experimental period. We expect to hear what they decide during News at 10. It now looks as though Mrs Thatcher will vote against. She was originally opposed to the experiment, but lately she was said to have changed her mind, and the main question now is how many MPs will follow her lead tonight. The motion is that this House approves in principle experimental televising of its proceedings and will set up a select committee to organise the experiment. Now, let's go over to Westminster, where our political editor, Glyn Mathias, is waiting with the latest news. At this moment, MPs are going through the division lobbies, deciding the issue whether or not to admit the television cameras. As the arguments have ebbed and flowed during the day's debate, so has the discussion and speculation about how the vote is going to go. It's a free vote, uh, there's no party whip, but much depends on how many MPs follow the lead of the Prime Minister, and Mrs Thatcher has decided to vote against the cameras. She had indicated at one stage that she was in favour of televising at least the big occasions, but now it seems she's been swayed by the fears that admitting cameras may change the nature of the House and damage its authority. The question today was whether MPs should follow the example of the House of Lords and go for an experiment of televising. Kevin Dunn reports on the debate. If ever there was a debate the broadcasters would have loved to have shown, this was it. With MPs freed from their party whips, Inspired by personal conviction rather than political commitment, the chamber crackled with... ...putting forward proposals that can create a framework, perhaps a new framework in which uh, there can be equality of treatment of all people, which will be the basis of a whole process of reconciliation. That's how I intend to judge the outcome, but we must wait and see. But the size of the anti-Hume, anti-Dublin lobby is well known. In the forefront of loyalist opposition, Ian Paisley joins official unionist colleagues in threatening resignation of their Stormont and Westminster seats and will attend a unionist summit tomorrow. Reaction from the loyalist community itself, no one can predict. The Paramilitary Ulster Defence Association say they'll wait and see. But the British government is mindful of the reaction 11 years ago to the Sunningdale Agreement when the Ulster Workers' Council strike caused havoc here and destroyed any thoughts of a power-sharing executive. We have had these agreements before and every one of them has been bust and this agreement will be bust. I need to tell the people of Northern Ireland that in no way is the sovereignty of Britain over Northern Ireland diminished when it is. I mean, that is pure lying through their teeth. And it will not be accepted by the people of Northern Ireland. Who do they take us for? They think we're idiots. Northern Ireland is littered with failed political initiatives, but this one could have some success. Never before have the British and Irish governments reached a consensus on the province, and they will do so tomorrow with a determination to resist loyalist condemnation, balancing that with an unequivocal joint commitment to defeating the provisionals. Michael Macmillan, News at 10 at Hillsborough Castle. The High Court in London has released the assets of the National Union of Mine Workers. The judge, Mr Justice Nichols, lifted the sequestration order on £10 million of the union's money today after Mr Scargill and the rest of the union's executive went to court to apologise for their contempt. The order was first imposed a year ago. Unexpectedly, Mr Scargill took the whole executive from the TUC to court for what for the union was going to be an historic apology. A fleet of taxis ferried them there. Apparently the president wanted all 24 to be present if he was to climb down in public. Court 40 was packed. Mrs Scargill, McGahey and Heathfield squeezed onto the front bench along with lawyers, the receiver and the sequestrators. Behind them, nine barristers. And behind them, the full executive, the public and dozens of reporters, many standing, others unable to get into the court at all. For the union, Mr Gavin Lightman said the burden of sequestration was heavy, the contempt would not be repeated, the strike was over. 
The court was hushed as he read out this key sentence. Arafat's PLO. President Mubarak insisted that it was part of the agreement reached on board the ship yesterday. They could ask the captain of the ship who informed us that they haven't, that they have no body injured on board of the ship. It is registered and recorded in our uh, record. But apparently, uh, Ambassador, uh, American Ambassador Veliotis was aboard the ship, and when he found out that one of the people, one of the Americans was killed... Why didn't the captain tell us that uh, there was somebody killed? Would have changed our mind in the whole process. Late this afternoon, the Achille Loro was waiting to leave, and the six Britons who were among the hostages appeared on the rail to wave to newsmen below. The six, five dancers and a hairdresser who work on the liner, were obviously relieved. It's been a very trying ordeal for them, but I, I'm proud to say that uh, they've done a very good job, actually. They've, um, they've uh, they kept on a brave face, and uh, I think... Some of the passengers have come up to us to say... Yes. Uh, how you know strong they've been and how cheerful they've uh, kept everybody. Yes, I think you can be very proud, proud of them. Actually. The Egyptian argument is that saving the lives of those on board was the overriding consideration. That the agreement made with the PLO was made in good faith before anyone knew of any killing, and only on the condition that the hijackers would be brought to justice by the PLO itself. But tonight, Egypt, a country so firmly allied to the West, is coming under fierce criticism from the United States let alone the Israelis, who are claiming they've irrefutable proof that the PLO knew in advance of the plot to hijack the Italian ship. David Smith, News at 10, Cairo. It now seems almost certain that the Israeli government knew all along that Palestinian gunmen were going to seize the boat, and highly probable that although ministers were silent throughout the crisis, that they knew more than anyone else about who was on the Achille Lauro and why. Military sources say their intelligence knew that a radical group was attempting to launch an attack inside Israel using a vessel that would visit this Israeli port as cover. Once here at Ashdod, a regular stopping off point for Mediterranean cruise liners, they would launch an attack. The Israeli Navy, already having stopped several previous attempts by guerrillas to land by rubber boat, knew that an act of sea piracy was expected. <coughs> Tonight, the head of military intelligence confirmed it, but when asked did they know gunmen had boarded in Italy, the response clouded the issue. I wouldn't like to, to uh, react on, on this uh, point. The government, it's now being said by intelligence sources, knew that the four gunmen boarded the vessel at Genoa and that plans existed for Israeli forces to board the Achille Lauro once she had left Egyptian territorial waters. The question now is why apparently no other government had been told about it. The Prime Minister says the deal that ended the affair has set a terrible precedent. To let them go free without punishment meanwhile more than 500 passengers flew in from rome they had left the ship in alexandria before it was hijacked among them a number of britons with mixed feelings but nevertheless life has to go on there's been many many terrorist attacks and i think if we give in to them in this respect and not continue in our normal way of life then they've achieved their purpose they hope to board the ship tomorrow, a holiday many wish was over, rather than restarting. Brent Sadler, News at 10, Israel. Whatever the Israelis may have known, at the White House, the long hours during and after this hostage crisis have found the Reagan administration in confusion. Never certain quite what had happened, the confirmation that Leon Klinghoffer, a double-stroke victim, wheelchair-bound, had been murdered by the hijackers, only came once this man, Nicholas Viliottis, America's ambassador to Cairo, had boarded the liner. On ship-to-shore radio, he reported back to his embassy. Campaigning in Chicago, Reagan demanded their prosecution too, and in what is seen as an extraordinary slip, said he would accept the PLO prosecuting the hijackers themselves. All right, but just so they are brought to justice. So you'd let the PLO punish them then? Huh? Yes, if they're, if they're determined to do that. During a stop in a local cake factory, his officials suddenly realized he had inadvertently recognized the PLO as a sovereign organization, something America has refused to do for 40 years. 
brought out to a hastily convened corrective news conference, the PLO was summarily de-recognized. Well, I, I really believe that the PLO, if the hijackers are in their custody, should turn them over to a sovereign state uh, that would have jurisdiction and could prosecute them as the murderers that they are. On Capitol Hill, many are enraged. The president himself is under fire. Get off of your stick, Mr. President. The American people are sick and tired of being kicked around. It's on your back now. Yesterday, Egypt let four of the terrorists go and we give them $2.3 billion in, in aid every year. They knew that these were terrorists and they let them go. We ought to suspend aid to Egypt until they give us a response. White House observers believe that anti-terrorist rhetoric has now backed the Reagan administration against the wall. The demand for action is gathering momentum. John Snow, News at 10, Washington. All the evidence tonight, and not just from Israel, points to an attempted Palestinian raid on the Israeli port of Ashdod, which went horrendously wrong. Even Yasser Arafat's people in Tunis, still recovering from the recent Israeli airstrike, which may have prompted such a reprisal operation, they've now admitted that the hijackers were trying to get to Israel. So from Cyprus has another Palestinian faction, the PLF, and in Cairo, the semi-official newspaper Al Haram has carried the same story. The truth of what happened last Tuesday when the Achille Laro was anchored off Tartus is going to be crucial. For by then, it seems, everyone, the Egyptians, the PLO, working with the Italians, the Israelis and the Americans, was either involved in stitching up a deal or was ready for military action if it didn't work. A deal which was suddenly threatened by the murder of Mr Klinghoffer by the agitated hijackers. A murder which the captain certainly knew about. One report says he came face to face with one of the hijackers covered in blood. The evidence further suggests that as the ship returned to port side for the hijackers to be handed over, the captain faced an impossible choice. Should he let the handover go ahead, which is eventually what happened at port side, thus ensuring the safety of 400 passengers or crew, or should he jeopardize everything by revealing before he got to port side that Mr. Klinghoffer had been killed? In the end, it seems clear that he decided on the first course of action, for it was the Italian Prime Minister, Mr. Craxi, after a direct conversation with the Italian captain, who eventually broke the news of Mr. Klinghoffer's death, some five hours after the hijack ended. With that revelation came a whole new set of problems, especially for President Mubarak and Yasser Arafat. They're all too mindful of the likely reaction from both Tel Aviv and Washington if they allow Mr. Klinghoffer's murderers to go free. So the hijackers are apparently still on the ground at that Egyptian airport tonight while President Mubarak tries to decide what to do. The actor, writer and director Orson Welles, once hailed as the boy wonder of Hollywood, is dead. He was 70 and had been suffering from heart trouble and diabetes. <laughs> Harry. Whether as Harry Lyme in the film The Third Man, or as a child who could read at two and recite King Lear by the time he was seven, Orson Welles spent his life chasing and often grabbing the limelight. His radio reading of War of the Worlds about a Martian invasion was so believable it caused panic in the streets of America. His screen roles, too, were unforgettable cameos. At the age of 24, he created the film masterpiece Citizen Kane. But many producers refused to back him because, they said, his projects were too expensive. He surprised many in later life by giving his weighty endorsement to a television commercial for Sherry. In recent months, he'd come back to working on yet another version of King Lear, bringing his life full circle and talking about facing up to death. I felt that uh, death was very close to me. Ever since I, I, uh, I was about 10 years old. And although from an actuarial point of view, death is actually closer to me now, uh, it could not be closer than it's always been. On the eve of Mrs. Thatcher's speech to the Conservative Conference, the Energy Secretary, Mr. Walker, says complacency on unemployment is political suicide. A report next. Plus the mentally handicapped boy who has to live in an adult home. And Yul Brynner, the king to the end, is dead. That's in a couple of minutes.
Oh, when you see how cleverly we design our TV. Yellows, greens, browns, purples, pinks. The new FST sets from Ferguson. With flatter, squarer tubes. No one is more switched on. There's a health food store in your neighborhood that sells six different kinds of rice, including brown, that has a full range of fiber-rich beans and pulses. Lots of pure fruit juices and pure water and more mueslis and yogurts than you thought possible. There are whole wheat pastas, low-fat milks, and even low-fat sausages. And uh, we also sell bath salts. Sainsbury's, where good food costs you less. World Cup football for the family. England versus Turkey at Wembley. Come early to be sure of a seat. Oh, one, right, oh, two, one, two, three, four, Wembley! When you buy a travel card, you can not only get cheaper travel on the tube, on top of that, you get the buses for free. The travel card. Huxley's has got small outspan. Oh, no! Watch out for outspan. Small ones are more juicy. The Energy Secretary, Mr Peter Walker, said in Blackpool tonight that the Conservative Party was giving the impression of not caring about ordinary families. He said complacency about unemployment was political suicide. He spoke to the Tory Reform Group on the eve of Mrs Thatcher's speech at the party conference and a day after Mr Norman Tibbet warned the Tory troops not to fire at each other. Mr Walker abandoned his normal, carefully coded phrases and delivered his message straight. A plea for a change of course that set him defiantly at odds with the Prime Minister and many Cabinet colleagues. And after six years of government, we must not give any impression that we have stopped listening to ordinary families because what they want to say is, in my view, the key to the future Tory strategy. But I sense that many now feel that the government, their government, is a bit remote, perhaps uncaring, about what concerns them and obsessed with matters which do not concern them. They are not moved by the latest definition of the money supply or the government's ability to hit it or, as the case may be, not hit it. Unemployment, he said, was touching even comfortable families. There can be uh, no comfort in the fact that 87% uh, are still at work. If we expose that complacent attitude it will, in my view, be political suicide for us amongst decent working families. For they will not be satisfied with the morality of I'm all right, Chad. Applause at the end for an unsettling message. Unemployment, Mr Walker had said, was as big a potential vote loser in the tree-lined suburbs as in the decaying inner cities. David Walter, News at 10, Blackpool. The Home Secretary, Mr Douglas Hurd, told the Conservatives he would bring in a new public order bill. It would mean life imprisonment for carrying firearms, a new offence of disorderly conduct for frightening and distressing people, and new powers for the police to control football crowds and pickets. The recent inner city riots set the conference alight today for the first time this week. Mrs Thatcher heard a Midlands councillor call the rioters filth. He said they should be swept from the streets 
and he went further. Politicians are often regarded as arrogant. We would refute this, but is it not arrogance for us to place our views over the 85% of the population who want the restoration of capital punishment? The riots and crime in Brixton will ruin the black community more than anyone because it's their houses that burn and it's their shops that are looted. I ask Mr Hurd, no more judicial inquiries. These hooligans are lawbreakers and must take the consequences. Winding up, the Home Secretary tried to refute claims that spending more money would end the rioting. The task of bringing criminals to justice must not be complicated and obscured by arguments about other matters. Bad, bad housing, high unemployment, social deprivation, these are evils in themselves and it's part of the job of a Tory government to find practical remedies for them. These remedies may cost money, that money is being found, but public expenditure is not a remedy for crime and let no one deceive you otherwise. It was an impressive performance by the new Home Secretary. He'd also announced a new offence of disorderly conduct. It'll be a step up from breach of the peace, carrying much heavier fines and giving the police a stronger weapon against what Mr Hurd had called rowdy and intimidating behaviour. Outside the hall, hundreds of police, some mounted, kept a student demo against education cuts and unemployment well away from the conference. Back inside the hall, the day's main theme of concern and anger about the riots continued during an emergency debate on race relations. Bernie Grant, Labour's leader in Haringey, was a constant target. We must destroy this cancerous growth of rioting and hooliganism, which has hissed our society with the speed of hurricane, the strength of Hercules, and will erupt like a volcano. Mr Grant, if, you're an, if your ambition to enter Parliament will be to represent a people of murderers, rioters, looters, muggers, and such like, thank God you're in the Labour Party and not the Conservatives. <laughs> is I am conservative, I'm black, I'm British, and I'm proud of all three. Though no speaker today had called for repatriation, indeed the voice of the outside right had only been heard in isolated heckling, the minister said not only would repatriation not work, but in trying to implement such a policy, the great majority of the ethnic minority population who would remain could become so alienated from the rest of the community that the chances of building one nation in which people of differing ethnic backgrounds could live in harmony together would be gone forever. While deeply concerned about the riots, the Tories believe that some Labour councillors' apparent support for the rioters has handed them a vote winner. David Rose, News at 10, Blackpool. Tomorrow, the Conservative conference will get a ticking off from four charities who say that the government hasn't kept its word about helping the mentally handicapped. They say that five years ago, it was agreed that mentally handicapped children would be better looked after at home or in small homes in the community. And yet today, more than 450 of them are still living in special long-stay Clive hospitals. Clive Powling is 16. He is too severely mentally handicapped to be looked after at home, so has spent most of his life in Botley Park Hospital in North Surrey, the only child among 650 adults. Clive is just one of 450 children now living permanently in adult long-stay mental handicap hospitals in England and Wales. According to the Spastic Society, grossly inadequate staffing means that however dedicated the nurses are, and staff at this hospital say they care very much indeed, the children are deprived of essential attention. But his mother says she couldn't cope with him at home. No, it was night and day all the time. What would uh, you like to see happen to Clive now? Like I'd like, to, like him to be in a, uh, with more people, that's a lot more supervision. A smaller place, which I've heard of, is a good idea. Glebe House, which is within a mile of Botley Park, has been specially adapted for the needs of young people with severe mental handicaps. Just five young people live here. It's their home for life. They all had the same kind of disabilities as Clive, but because of intensive caring by eight staff, their lives have changed. Charlie, at 12, the youngest person here, couldn't walk when he came. Now he skips. 
Charlie went into Botley Park when he was three and stayed till he was ten. He used to be kept in a playpen for his own safety. Then he cried a lot. Now he's calmer. So what changes has his mother seen? He's a much happier child, I think. He's quieter. He's uh, cleaner. It's much easier to take him out than it was before. How would you describe um, Charlie? What sort of boy is he? He's a happy child. The health authority is trying to find a place for Clive, but Glebe House is now full and there's nowhere else he could be near his mother. Clive is now 16 and will soon no longer be eligible for a special place for children. If he does not get moved soon, he may spend the rest of his life confined in an institution. Besides Orson Welles, Hollywood is also mourning Yul Brynner tonight. He was 65. The son of a half Mongolian, half Swiss father and a gypsy mother, he was a natural for the more exotic roles on the screen and stage. And it's as the King of Siam that he'll be remembered. Now you understand about women. So many English books are read introduce strange idea of love, etc., etc., etc. Yul Brynner, an actor of unmistakable style, made bald both beautiful and box office. He first shaved his head in 1951 for the stage version of The King and I. He went on to star in the film with Deborah Carr and won an Oscar. He felt, though, that his looks typecast him as Siamese kings or pharaohs. However, in King Vidor's biblical spectacular Solomon and Sheba, he was allowed to appear with hair. In 1960, he starred in one of Hollywood's most famous westerns, The Magnificent Seven. Turn that rig around and get it down the hill. The main headlines again. Four youngsters aged between 13 and 15 have been arrested in connection with the murder of police constable Keith Blakelock in the Tottenham riot. And the four Palestinians who hijacked the Achille Lauro cruise liner are waiting at an Egyptian military airport to be flown out of the country. Finally, we must repeat that the photograph shown with the first headline on News at 10 tonight had nothing whatsoever to do with the arrests in North London tonight. And we apologise for the error. That's it. Good night. After the Thames News headlines, Cliff Robertson stars in the thriller Obsession. Why is your five called Ritz? Because it's a little cracker. The all-new Renault 5. What's yours called? Ha! Ah, now with Allure, the new style radiator that's setting a fashion for heating. Ring 464-6575 now. Nationwide Bonus Builder is a remarkable new extra interest, instant access saving scheme that you can open with just £100. And immediately, some of your money will start helping to build the homes Britain wants. But there's more to Bonus Builder. The more you save, the higher the interest rate rises. Because more savings in Nationwide means more funds for more homes. And for you, it means that when your savings reach £10,000, you move to Nationwide's top rate of 9.5% net. And that's what makes Bonus Builder such a well-planned scheme. The more you save, the more you'll earn. And the more you invest, the more we can keep putting the building back into society at Nationwide. The IBM PC-80. Businesses now have a better way to handle the daily downpour of information. The PC-80 can store not 500, not 1,000, not 10,000, but as much as 20,000 pages of information, all safely under lock and key. The IBM PC-80, your key to more powerful personal computing. Whenever I'm away from England, there are times where I long for the well-turned English phrase. For a bit of intelligent discussion about films, books, darts and jazz. That's when I sneak off to where I can get it. The British Embassy. 
You're a guardian, Mr. Lloyd. Thank you. Good evening. Four men are being questioned by police tonight after a gun battle in East London. A team of police marksmen from the Central Robbery Squad were keeping watch on some armed men in Carlton Square in Hackney when they were spotted and fired on. Police returned the fire, but no one was hurt. A stray bullet embedded itself in the staircase of a pensioner's home. Three shotguns were later recovered. An MP says the police should be forced to get a magistrate's permission before using firearms during house searches in the wake of the shooting which sparked the recent Brixton riots. Simon Hughes, the Liberal MP for Southwark and Bermondsey, said tonight that the government must also radically rethink the way inner city areas are treated to avoid further trouble. About a hundred members of the public and a Labour councillor were ejected from a council meeting by police tonight. Last uh, month they claimed they hadn't been told by Westminster Council that up to a thousand homes on the Walterton and Elgin estates in Paddington could be sold off to developers because the council can't afford repairs. Tonight they were angered when they learnt of a letter from a firm of architects to the council dating from March. The GLC leader, Ken Livingstone, was among those ejected. Labour councillors then walked out. Mr Livingstone later pledged a grant to the action group opposed to Westminster's plan. A £135 million road scheme to relieve traffic congestion in East London in the 1990s has been given the go-ahead. It's the biggest road project in London since the Westway was built. It'll create more than three miles of dual carriageway between Hackney Wick and the M11 and will include a tunnel under the Green Man interchange, but it's been attacked by local councils and the GLC. A 16-year-old girl told a court today how she was raped 30 times at knife point by a gang of youths in Brixton. Her friend said she was raped 10 times. Seven teenagers deny attacking them and the trial is continuing. In Hendon, police operating a hotline for information on the two rapists thought to have attacked 23 women in northwest London say they've uncovered many more previously unreported rapes. They've had 350 calls in seven days, 60 from women who've been assaulted. A record producer who's helped people like David Bowie to the top is grooming aspiring pop stars of tomorrow. Tony Visconti has taken 30 people under his wing at London's first pop music school in Soho. One of them, three-year-old Thomas Walter from Wilsdon, already seems to have star quality. But you look sweet upon the seat of a bicycle built for two. Police in Essex who are hunting a tattooed man who tried to kidnap a ten-year-old girl warned tonight he could strike again. He tried to lure the girl into his blue Ford Cortina as she walked to school in Pitsy. Detectives say it could be linked with similar local incidents two years ago. The man has a red snake tattoo on his arm. Detectives are searching for a gang of youths who it's believed gave bottles of acid to youngsters on Tottenham's Broadwater Farm estate with the order to turn them into bombs to throw at police. This 14-year-old boy said he was given the acid, but called in the police. And, of course, tonight's top story, four boys aged between 13 and 15 have been arrested by police investigating the murder of Constable Keith Blakelock during the Tottenham riot on Sunday. They're being questioned tonight at several police stations in North London. Constable Blakelock was stabbed to death while helping to protect a fireman. And now, Thames weather. Tonight, dry and mild... Tomorrow, the chance of drizzle at first, but brighter in the afternoon. The high, 17 degrees Celsius, that's 63 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's it. More Thames news tomorrow. Now, Obsession. <laughs>